Okay, uh, introduce yourself please, uh, and we'll go from there. I am Benjamin J. Heckendorn, B-E-N-J-A-A-M-I-N, Heckendorn, H-E-C-K-E-N-D-O-R-N. And uh, I have a side project, which is designing and building pinball machines for some reason. For some reason. When uh, when did this interest start? Like, um, seriously? I started working on my Bill Paxton pinball machine back in 2005, and I tinkered that with that for about five years and I finished it in 2010 then I took it to a local show the Midwest Gaming Classic in Wisconsin and people thought it was really cool so I was like I should design some more stuff famous last words and uh what why why that theme what what inspired that theme of all things you could have done yeah um I wanted a theme that would confuse and uh, uh astound people like I wanted the people to think why the heck did he do that why did he pick that theme I mean most geeks would have done like Bruce Campbell or something, but I thought Bill Paxton was more interesting. You know, there's just a wider variety of films he's been in, more quotes for the game. Did you get the response you wanted? From people? Yeah. Yeah, it's, people seem to like it. And I always thought it was funny, like, there's a lot of vulgarity in the game, and it shows people would be like playing it with their kids, and they're going to be playing it. And they'd never even batted an eye when the vulgarity came out of it. So I guess not everybody cares about family mode. And that game's currently on route, you said? Is that, is that uh, on it's location? It's at SS Billiards in Minneapolis. Yeah. Yep, so Lloyd has it. Wow. That's, that's, I guess that's where it's going to stay, because I don't care about it anymore. It's done. It's in the past. Is that how it is, the, the process? You work on a game, and then uh, you're done. It's your masterpiece, and you move on to doing new painting. Masterpiece? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> um, I certainly, yeah, once it's done, I don't... When I say don't care about it, I mean, I still support it, like... They'll, there will probably still be at least two more code updates for Burns Most Haunted. Um, but as far as, or, or besides that, besides supporting it, yeah, I don't care. It's done. Goodbye. I don't. I don't have an America's Most Haunted. I don't want one. It's 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 dead to me. Uh, so what was the process like from going being a uh, an enthusiast to a full blown designer? Like. Yeah, it's a business. Well, I had to learn a lot along the way, and actually, you know, learn things from the classic designers, like Nordman and uh, even Papa Duke. And then, uh, you know, we'd be at shows, and uh, I think Steve Ritchie was playing at a show, and he was like, "Oh, you should do this, this, and this." He, he was he wasn't too critical of it. He was just like, "Yo, you should change that target, and make it skinnier, and then uh, put metal here." And uh, I'm not hating it. So Not yeah, hating it is a good compliment. From yes, Steve. I know that's about as best as good as you can get from him. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I, I had to learn a lot along the way. Like everything in the Bill Paxton game was like wrong and half-ass, and even on the Ghost game, I did a lot of things not really the way they should have been done, because I started that. I was working on that for like a year before Chuck even started his business, and uh, so when Chuck took it and you know made it into got it ready for manufacture he had to do redo a lot of things that i had done so if i were to do another game i'm sure i would do more of those things right the first time and hopefully make the process a little faster so before you started to work on designing pinball machines there wasn't a designing pinball machines for dummies book it, it doesn't exist it well designing pinball machines is for dummies <laughs> because it's a uh, horrible horribly taxing thing to do <laughs> It's tough, you know, it's like, I've, I've had some dumb hobbies in the past, and I don't know how I got into that. I mean, it's worked out okay in the end, but it's very difficult. When you're going through the, the process, did you think at any point, like, yeah, I don't know what the end result's going to be, or, you know, hmm. like, man, this is, of is this going to be, is this, game or what e game? Uh, well, the build packs, and with, with each game, like, you know, because the, well, the first one was to complete a game that it played and it worked, you know, functionally, right, with some code and, and some modes. And then, you know, if you're making a game to sell, then that's a, there's a lot of expectations for a game that's, like, cost money these well, days, yeah, right? Yeah, Amer America's Most Haunted had to be, you know, several steps above Bill Paxton, more than several steps above it. Uh, the main thing I kind of shot for was to have... Um, the game is a little too difficult, I think, especially geometry-wise. It could be easier. America's Most Haunted. Yeah. Um, but I did try to make the code deep, 
and then every mode um, even if you you know if you complete the mode but you can do things within the mode so you can always do better you know there's always more things you can achieve during the mode or more sub goals you can achieve so even if you come back to it you can improve upon your score and so that's good for um, to me it's a it's a good tournament game we have at the tournament here uh, this year Southern Fry Gaming Expo and uh, it's made uh, a few people mad. Every game has, but it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 wonderful to see. Uh, is, it, is it is it is it crueler than uh, Braun Stoker's? Really? Is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, okay, I was gonna say you got a Braun no. Stoker's in there. <laughs> no, yeah, it's set yeah, it's set pretty brutal. Um, Bram Stoker's it, it can be easier. You know, you get the miss multi ball and yeah, and then you can start stacking from there, but. I wish it was an easier game. See, what I, one thing I learned from Papa Dude was uh, if you make it in foam, and we would actually hot glue foam and like shoot a foam game. Like we didn't just make it in foam and look at it. We would shoot the ball around it. And you can. You know, we would have a, a wooden play field that was just blank with, with the flippers and Italian bottom. But then all like the paths and ramps and stuff, we made it a foam and we'd shoot it and make sure it worked. And then when we put it into metal, everything got faster. Maybe too fast. So you know, like, oh look, we have flow. It moves, it moves quickly, but you also kind of shoot yourself in the foot because it moves a little too quickly. And also, we had the very large coils, like the 11 269s, so you can make that jump ramp, which was a mistake of design to have that. So anyway, that needing the stronger coils in order to make that one shot makes all the other shots more dangerous, which is a negative. Well, the other way, well, oh, the other end of the spectrum would be it's limp. It's too, it's too easy. It's you know, the shots aren't unique or yeah, interesting. Yeah, I was playing uh, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein earlier, and I hadn't played the game in years, and it's really easy. It's really easy to keep the ball alive. So, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a balance, I guess. But I want to make, as I said, I want to make my next game a little, a little easier from a geometric standpoint, and just make the code even deeper. A little more easier, meaning like you. You can not like as grow into and, it, grow into it. Not or? as fast and brutal. Okay. But then to supplement that, yeah, with like deeper rules and deeper code, and extend those it, things out. Like more toys, or we'd have different angles more, of shots, or more depth to the. Wait, you mean to make it easier physically? Yeah. Well, just it, work on making the returns work even better. Make know. the shots a little slower. I know that kind of sounds like counterintuitive, what people would normally want, but. Just to slow it down a little bit so it's a little bit more forgiving. But then supplement that with, yes, deeper rules. And this one, um, uh, I, I don't know how they, the other ones play, but the one here, it's uh, in the bottom of the game. I like how it'll bounce from one side to the other, and it kind of, it's not so much dangerous. It's uh, you have to, you know, kind of move the game and, 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 you know, slingshot it you know at at the other side to keep it alive and I kind of like that instead of tr you know some games it just goes straight down to the flipper straight down to the flipper and well it's th that's what you want it to do <laughs> that's what you want the ball to do in design, okay but it doesn't always yeah so it's like best laid plans are like the uh, ghost loop thing like if you hit that on the extremity like with the left flipper it should return to the right flipper and vice versa but that's in a perfect world so if you don't hit it dead on it can be a little dangerous and so the main things you learned from America's Most Haunted that you apply to your next game would be... Well, I haven't started your next game, so I guess I really haven't thought it learned out. anything that I can apply, but... You're still kind of, you know, studying America's Most Haunted for what it is, and... No, I'm not studying that. I'm going to make something completely different. <laughs> so you're just going to forget, it, like, hey, it's No, I'm not going to forget new. what I learned, but I'm not really going to base it off of that game. Right, that's what I, I meant. Like, I would like to have, like, maybe a third flipper, maybe. Okay. Yeah, um, that little miniature space shuttle game that I made, there's actually a few things in that that I might do on a future game, like at full scale. Yeah, we'll see. I think I might get rid of the plunger, just have an auto plunger, save a few yeah. bucks. <laughs> a few bucks. Yeah, um, I was thinking about making like the, in that one of those uh, Zen pinball games, they have this scoop that can rotate. So you shoot the ball into the scoop and then it rotates and it spits it out someplace else. So it's like, that'd be really cool. That's like that's something from a virtual pinball that might be able to be built in reality. So well, that might be fun to build. Yeah, Stern Viper has a, a spinning uh, scoop. It's not. A, it's a lock. 
but it also it sp it spins, it locks, and it it goes three you know three sixty around, and then you shoot it uh, with the flipper button. So uh, that's been done. Not so much a lock, but well, it is a lock, but it didn't go inside and out oh, another stern end. Stern viper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. It's neat. I mean, it's early solid state. I'm like, whoa, that's like. And it's not been on a game since, whereas a lot of things, yeah, they, you know, oh, I like that in the 70s, and you bring it into a newer game, and like, well, it's brand new to most people. I'd probably try to make the Outlands a little easier. Outlands are brutal on a lot of games, but I feel they can be a little safer on our game. I mean, you don't want to be too safe, but you also want, don't want people to be discouraged. But when the game is difficult, it gives it a really good one more time feeling. Whereas if you play a game and it's got like this floaty long ball time and you play through it once, it's like a 10 or 15 minute game and you're like, eh, I don't want to play this again, I want to do something else. You can so. take a break for, you know, like, yeah, like Lord of the Rings, things like that. Yeah, or I've had like, I, I can take a break for a week or a month. And yeah, not but if be, you kick someone's butt in three minutes, they'll be right back. It's like you're training. You're like you're training them to be, it's like, hey, let's keep going at it so you get better so you get a high score. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's what I read. Everyone's <laughs> like, they want, they want fast games and, and difficult games so uh, that was one of because like, for the home use that's what they want they want a game they don't get bored of so most home users have said that like hey I want rules I want well harder. at least on pin side that's what we're at, where I read well, isn't that most the buyers pin yeah side. <laughs> so yeah you want you want a game that uh, is difficult you don't want an easy game yeah like you see people talking about like theater magic we were talking about like right uh, they get bored of it very quickly so I mean we've had we had one person get to the wizard mode on America's Masada and I think he did finally beat it too it's the only person I've heard of doing it. Um, so he's like, oh, yeah, there's this whole other mode that no one else has gotten to or gotten to yet. Uh, in reference to coding, are, are we at the point in pinball where uh, coding is at least as important as the layout? Are we getting to that point in pinball where... Yes, I think we are. It's... Yeah, I mean, you see it online. Like, the second question is always who's coding it. And then, like, if it's not, you know, Lyman Sheets or Keith Richards, you were like, uh. And, you know, we get that with our second game. Like, I'm not the main coder on Rob Zombie. And uh, hopefully that's all right with people. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, because people want deep games and good rules. Yeah. Because so if you have a game in your house for years, I mean, sometimes indefinitely, I don't know, the whole phenomenon of owning games in your house is, you know, relatively new. I mean, there's always been people, but now it's like, every who doesn't have, you know, who in the pinball community doesn't have a, a game at their house, and who doesn't want to eventually have a new inbox, and then it's going to get to the point where it's going to be like, who doesn't have, who hasn't bought a new inbox, and... Well, if the prices keep going up, that's not really going to increase in frequency. Prioritize, man. <laughs> Everybody needs a pinball machine in their house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I don't know if everyone needs one, or would want one even but it's pretty cool but out of the woodworks to me it's every single day there's new people in a pinball every single day there's new buyers so I, I yeah that's why I think it's important to pick themes that you know can appeal to people under 60 you don't see that a lot really what <laughs> gray haired rock man <laughs> 3d well there's a there's a rumor that's turned my new Jurassic World yeah. Which would make a lot of sense because look at how much goddamn money that movie's making. Because, how old, no, I guess your age, you're 34. Was it right? Yeah. Right on? Yeah. I'm really good at that. I am too. Okay, anyway, so like people your age are slightly younger. They love Jurassic Park when they saw it as a kid. I was a little too old. But anyway, those people are flocking to the movies right now to watch that. You're right. It's, it's basically the first nostalgia movie for that generation that came after my generation right and um so you know you might say oh we can make a well kiss the selling really well of course but you know some other themes but you know you gotta you go you gotta go after that 30 year old money 30 year old kid money i mean right and uh, i think that's something that could be well served in pinball so you know everyone wants like an Elvira three but it's like well, come on get over with it i know <laughs> it was it would still sell like gangbusters but right. at a certain point you have to um lower your demographic target to get the new money right because all of the baby boomer money is going somewhere most likely it's going to millennials gen x and millennials some yeah. way so at a certain point these people these and they'll become buyers these 58 yeah. year olds who are buying kiss right now yeah. whoever it is 
pretty soon they'll be just driving RVs around the country, selling all their stuff, getting ready to retire, and they're not going to buy things anymore. So, and once that, once that market's gone, will it ever come back? I mean, young people don't grow up with pins. Right. So you need, need to at least have themes that they might like. And, and to them it's new. That's the one, that's one of the saving graces about pinball is it's new to most people. So it's like, well, what is this? Uh, where's like, oh, that, you know, it's like. <laughs> yeah, there was another thing I was talking to my friend, he's like 27, and uh, he's talking about Kung Fury or some one of those kitschy 80s kind of throwback things. And he's like, and I'm like, why do you have nostalgia for the 80s? Like, you were barely alive in the 80s. He's like, well, we're jealous that we didn't get to grow up in the 80s. And I'm like, huh? And he's like, well, think about it. Like, you know, when we were like teenagers, things like 9-11 were happening. And yeah. it was a, a shittier time, I guess, in general. You know, we just had like Iran Contra. And yeah. he's like, you know, he's like, you know, we, we kind of pine for that, that year that we never got to experience. So, yeah, if you, if you have, can like find the um, nostalgic nerve for like the younger people, especially like, yeah, the people who are getting jobs, they have money, but they don't, aren't necessarily completely bogged down by kids yet. That's where the money is. And... The 80s. Jurassic Park's theme song hit number one on the Billboard charts this week from 1993. So an instrumental from 1993 became a number one Billboard hit. It's nostalgia. It's nos- nostalgic crosshairs. I'm 39. Nostalgic crosshairs have moved off of my target age. Like Pixels, I don't, I don't know if it's really going to do all that. Uh, Terminator's going to bomb. The target has moved. So now it's going to be like 30-year-olds. To me, it's um, it, the 80s and 90s were relatively... I, I love the 90s. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I was more of an adult in the 90s, so, so yeah, I enjoyed it a lot more, too, because I was just a kid in the 80s. Right. But, you know, people who grew up in the 80s as a kid can be will typically be nostalgic for stuff as a kid, and then... And that nostalgia grows into what they liked in their, you know, teens and, and 20s. And uh, I we have a small arcade in Jacksonville, Florida at a place called Video Game Rescue. And you put Simpsons in there, people play it. You put Ninja Turtles in there, people play it. Oh, yeah. And, and, and these are themes that came out in the 80s, still relevant. I'd love to see some sort of stats when I die, you know, if... if, if if there's some, some way you could like get the stats, like how much money I would have pumped into that Ninja Turtles game, insane. Probably like a Harvard education amount of money. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I wouldn't want one though because it takes up too much space. <laughs> it's terrible. It has to. Like, it has to be like IKEA. Like it folds up and it slides into your. Yeah. It turns I, into something else, like a table or. <laughs> if th- if thirteen year old Ben knew that old Ben could you know buy one of those easily and put it anywhere he wanted, but wouldn't. He'd be like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But, yeah, you know, I always thought it'd be cool. Actually, no, it wasn't my idea. It was a friend of mine's idea. Um, he wanted to make, like, this flat arcade machine. So um, they would have a flat screen TV. But instead of being a full depth, because you don't need that full depth, because there's no, you know, CRT, you make something that kind of sits against the wall. So it's almost like it's, it's like, maybe eight inches out of the wall. So you still have the control panel and the screen, but it doesn't, it only takes up, like, this much depth. That might be kind of cool. Yeah, they make some things at the show. They're deeper than that, but they, the philosophy of, okay, we, we give you a base, which is basically a computer, and you add a TV to it. It's And they're selling, they say, so uh, there is a demand for that. Not everybody wants to collect uh, WPC2 boards. I have those. I have uh, Konami JAMA boards. You know, not, everybody wants to collect that and, uh, you know, and swap those out and, uh, or work on CRT monitors. N- nobody does that, um, and that's I mean, ten years from now, who's even going to be working on those? Do you think there might come a time when uh, the arcade games are undesirable to the point where they start to become scarce and they become desirable again because it'd be rare? It's already getting that way. Really? With weird uh, games. 80s. 80s. Are, I mean, my my view is that 80s have run their course other than really niche games, because the people buying it, aren't, there aren't many people buying 80s stuff. 90s stuff, there's a, there's a lot more upside. I mean, Marvel's Capcom 2, I just sold my Tekken tag for a thousand bucks. I mean, it's not a, you know, it's, it's people are in, they like, oh, I remember this one, and they're like, five. You know, and uh, Marvel's Capcom 2, people like want to buy it from me, I'm like, no, it earns every single day. I'm not gonna get rid of it, <laughs> no. My, my thing is I, I don't really get very nostalgic 
like I see like Dragon's Lair and like I couldn't play it because it was too much money when I was seven or eight or however old I was when that came out. But I look at it now and I'm like, well, this isn't even really a game. Right. <laughs> so I wouldn't really want it. If I want, I would want it on its merits, not its nostalgic merits. So. Yeah, it looks good. It's it's something you know. Gary Stern says it's it's uh, it's art furniture in a game. And I told that to one of my customers, and they they're like, yeah, because to to them it's mostly art and furniture. Yeah, the kids we, will play it. We ran into that when we did our uh, green America's Most Haunted cabinet. People hated it, and they're like, it has to look good in my home. And it's like, you know, that's that's a good point. You have to think about how it's going to look in someone's home. Because people spend hundreds of dollars for paintings or. Uh, the furniture has to look just right in uh, in their house, and oh, the, that tile better be look right, or we're getting divorced. It's like you better make the yard look like this, and it's yeah. uh, a pinball machine to be in a house. Uh, yeah, I better <laughs> it's look match the decor at least. Yeah, at least that, that's, a, that's at the least the season is, of decor. Yeah, you, you make the cabinet. <laughs> the cabinet comes in different color choices, so it matches your decor. Yeah, that's a gateway drug for the wives. You know, you got to get on Gary Stern right now. Yeah, yeah, pink, pink legs, and like the roller games here has pink legs. Well, and... no, not pink, but just you, you can make it match your house. I, I know, but the, okay, the, yes. but to me, it's you go to Home Depot and there's there's pink tools now, there's pink toolboxes. It's real, you know, and it's and it was, and and the thing is, it, it if it sells, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Test it out there, you know. No, they, just like you could have like, like your game is like it's an oyster and charcoal. You know, like you can pick the colors. Lavender. Yeah, so like it doesn't like stand out; it almost blends into the wall. And like here, someone's like, "Oh, like this, this color red goes with this off-white wall," and someone thought about that. You know. Yeah. It's not hard to do. It's called powder coating. I I, I do it on my games. It really is. It's not that that pricey. Um, but yeah, there could be a a, a market for that. Um, what are what do you? What are the keys to a success, uh, successfully developing and and producing uh, a boutique pinball machine? What what happens? License. The <laughs> <laughs> successful, I mean, I mean, you know, you put time in, you make it, it sells. You know. License. It, okay. <laughs> Well, okay, that's that's a like you really plan to fight. make 150, and it took us forever to sell that many. Okay. Whereas um, we're not taking money on the Rob Zombie game. Right. But you know we're basically putting people's name on the list, and they I don't know for sure, but they're almost already full on Friday. So in one week. Well, it wasn't just and even that. like a fringe license, like a yeah. Rob Zombie. Well, it the. Right, the license does sell the game, but also the reputation of, we can make a game. That's true. Yeah, that's and, true. And, 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 you know, we're serious about this, and you've seen our, you know, our code, and, you know. That did help, and we discovered along the way, like when America's Most Wanted started to pick up, the best advertisement was that they were shipping. Like, oh, I played this at my friend's house. It's real. I've seen it be shipped. And that's actually what caused the sales to you know, spike up was just the reality of it. So. so you got a lot of people saying word of mouth, word of mouth, word of yeah, mouth. Yeah, yeah, and the fact that they were actually shipping. So selling games is the best way to sell games, strangely enough. <laughs> so or shipping games is the best way to sell games. So shipping and then license, like, and then you know, shipping licenses. It's just like when women say they don't care how tall a guy is. People can say that a license is not important until they're blue in the face, but everybody wants licenses. If you go on pin side and say, hey, Anyone got an idea for an original theme? And they'll be like, Monsters! Original. <laughs> or. <laughs> With a never, Z. You never, you, never, you never see those kind of posts? Oh, it's instant. I mean, they should add a filter to the website. Where it's, you can <laughs> or, or, they'll be, or they'll be like, they'll be like, Alvira 3, uh, Black Knight 3000, Attack from Mars 3. It's like, none of these are original ideas. Yeah. Uh, it, well, the thing, the thing that... The problem with that is it's hard because you have to sell the concept. Like if you say Lord of the Rings, you're like, oh, okay, there's these characters. You have to destroy a ring. There's monsters. I understand the game. But if you have like America's Most Haunted, you know, people are familiar with those kind of TV shows, but you still have to explain everything. Like, well, of, all, of the million and a half things people complain about with that game, there's too much dialogue. It's like we have to set up the characters in order for it to make sense. It's not like... 
It's like, it, they didn't need that for Monty Python. Uh, uh, Medieval Madness. It's like, it's a Monty Python and the Holy Grail unlicensed game. They didn't need to because you already know those tropes. You know those archetypes of characters. Uh, Attack from Mars. We know what like a stereotypical 1950s army general sounds like. You, we get it. You have that shorthand. We didn't really have that luxury. You don't need a backstory. Like you don't yeah. need like plot, 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 words, words, words. You just need like dots. I yeah. Mean, the dots tell a tale on the and in the in the, the call out and just... if you look if you look at the Williams games from like the mid to late 90s they did mostly unlicensed themes original themes and they also didn't sell as much as the early 90s when they did mostly licensed games coincidence yeah yeah because if Stern was doing unlicensed you know they would they in what early right Stern now or... oh right now right now if they if they're trying to do unlicensed they wouldn't sell as well, much as Well, that's what Gary says. Like, you know, he, he, can sell a con- he can sell a container, container upon containers if he says Kiss or Metallica, especially overseas, because that's where half their games go. You know? Right. But if he's like, oh, yeah, it's uh, you're a football player and you're, you're a pool player, and like if you have to explain the game, you've already lost. <laughs> so that's two dings against Yeah, if you have to explain it, then... Well, it's the same thing with all the remakes in Hollywood. It's like... You know, you don't if if you're like, oh, Gremlins, okay, everyone's heard of that movie. You don't have to explain it, even if it's even if your target demographic is. I always I, I always you know get a gas out of like if they're remaking like an R-rated movie like RoboCop, but they have to remake it PG-13. It's like anyone who remembers this is old enough to watch an R-rated movie. So who are you, and you're trying to sell it to 13 year olds? Don't give a shit. It doesn't make sense. But yeah, I don't know. If I ever did an if I ever did another unlicensed theme. I probably you probably heard me say this. I'd probably do the Old Testament Bible adventure game. You, you probably or you will. <laughs> I don't know, but um, but you don't have to explain it to anybody. No. Everyone's no, like everything's yeah. numbered. Every, you know, like seven of this, three of this. That market's huge. I think I think it would sell better than people think, and you don't have to. Well, it would just be. Well, I don't want to explain that. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, but that's a big market. You, yeah, you so know, I, I think pin, Pinheads and Bayou 2 is... Well, see, that's the thing. You make it nice and deep. You know, you're like... You do this story, then you do this story, then you do this story. And... Well, I... I yeah. Maybe someday. But, but you still don't have to explain it. Everyone's heard those right. basic stories. And it's... You know, it's basic ancient storytelling. Basic story tropes. You know, right. hero's journey. But, you know, people hunting ghosts. That's a little more difficult to explain. But, you know, we, we finally got through it. You know, we got we sold 150. We, we could have sold more. You know, people are like, oh, you should sell more. Don't limit yourself. It's like we said 150. We said 150 just for sales. Yeah. Because people say they don't want a limited number, which means they, they want, want a limited number. number. It's all backwards. They just invert it. People get freaked out. They're like, where's the number on my game? It's like stamped on the play field. It's insane. <laughs> you know, we learned that pretty early on. Like, whatever people say they want or they don't want, they want. Really? Yeah. They say they don't want LEs. They want LEs. They don't. They don't care what number it is. They absolutely do care what number it is. So they say they want original themes. When they mean original themes, they mean like Williams' original themes. Like they want another medieval madness. So they want like the whole. They want remakes or they want uh, 2.0s or. Well, if, you, if yeah, like I said, you, like you see you see a topic about what original theme people want, and they immediately start spouting off 2. themes. Yeah, or or 2.0s. <laughs> Funhouse Five. It's like. <laughs> Yeah. I want yeah. five talking heads. Well, like, if I was to think, like, what original theme I would want, like, as a game for me to buy, and I can't think of one, honestly. I'm excited. Like, I, you know, if Game of Thrones is good, I might buy that, you know, um, because I, I, I can at least, I at least know what to expect, you know. And the license you'd want to do, if you could do it, would be... Futurama. If I could get any... Le- no, Futurama and Army of Darkness. Those would be my two top choices. Uh, I would probably edge out Army of Darkness, but we we did look into that, and uh, it got a little hot because of the new show coming out. I think it was timing. Yeah, I mean, like five years ago. I guess you know, the license is like coming back because there's an Ash vs. the Evil Dead show. A game like that, I mean, that would just fly out the door. How do you think Futurama would do? Futurama is popular with younger people, as I was mentioning, right. the, for the new money. Why? Do you think it might have some trouble? No, I... I um, it's a smarter show than Simpsons. It, 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 it is. Um, I don't know any cartoon 
the cartoon or cartoon-ish related pinball machine that did bad. South Park. It's didn't terrible, do bad. but it was huge. Right. It didn't Simpsons do pinball right. party. Right. Um, it mean, would never get into the homes, but Archer pinball would kill. Right. It would it would translate to pinball very well. Uh, it would be way too raunchy for a game. I saw the Keith Elwing uh, uh, prototype white wood online, and it had the Archer font, and I'm like, it's, I don't. It's, I guess it's not gonna be Archer. I, I don't know if. Yeah, I don't know if, who. It, it would be great. I think it could be a great theme, but you're kind of tight market on the that. The thing that, that always bugs me is um, people think about what things they like, and they also like pinball. So it's like that must make a great theme, but they really need to think about what themes are good, but can also fit pinball. If you're talking about like Archer or Futurama, for instance, Archer is a spy. He goes on missions, uh, so those could be your modes. It's very simple. Yeah. You know, do this, kill this guy, blow up this, Futurama, he's a delivery boy. So it's like, deliver ten things to this planet. So that shot represents that planet, ten shots, you know, makes sense. But then it's like, you know, you get more abstract things like, uh, well, the music games are very abstract, people love them, so I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, Walking Dead's a good example. It's like, you know, obviously people ate it up because they love zombies. It's like, I love zombies, I love pinball, therefore I want Walking Dead pinball. But That's what it was. Yeah, but it's like, th- th- done. Fit a pinball Take my machine. money. Yeah, I know, I know. They they sold out immediately. But I mean, people that don't play pinball, I'd say Walking Dead pinball. Like, oh my god! I'm like, okay. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like okay, I'm not gonna. <laughs> yeah. Or like Angry Birds was another one, which allegedly Stern worked on at one time, never finished, and. Uh, sounds stupid on paper but if you think about it you're flinging balls at things it's perfect for pinball i don't well, know why it never happened not just that for route uh, i mean kids like to they like silly stupid stuff and you know redemption games will never go away i call it child gambling yes and i just that's what it is i i can't do it um I, that's i'll never be an operator i'll never do we have to condition <laughs> the children to be excellent senior citizens to gamble like in 60 years yeah, it's a little early. A little early. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like you know, learn your skills first and pay your dues. And uh, at least pinball. That's the one thing I like about having my route is I get to see parents that their kids actually play together instead of staring at iPads and iPhones. And I mean, I've seen a kid with uh, their 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 parent and they're staring at iPad. TV's right at their face, head level. And then one kid like you know came out of his trance and. Watch me work on yeah. a pinball machine. I'm like, whoa! Like it's, a kid it's, actually it's is interested. It's amazing, like with people and their cell phones nowadays. It reminds me of that They Live movie. Yeah. But instead of like, you know, having the goggles on or off, it's like, it's like aliens could land on Earth and no one would see it because they're looking at their cell phone. Yeah, it's very brave new world. It's very They Live and. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, pinball philosophically, I'll say it puts you in the now. You can't be playing with your iPhone and. And, and, and you know you can't even take a take a pause or take you, a break. You, you you have to keep your fingers on the damn buttons. <laughs> you know, and it uh it, it's pinball making pinball is hard and playing pinball is hard and pinball is hard, you know, it's just <laughs> put that on a hat. Yeah. Pinball is hard. It, it, it is. There there's one question I was gonna ask during the uh, your presentation yesterday is that uh, uh you've done uh you know, B horror movies uh, mm-hmm. of the sorts. And I was ask, I was gonna ask, um, uh, will there be a cameo by Possum Man in the Rob Zombie pinball machine? Is could that be an Easter egg? Oh, I did, I did mention to Chuck if we could have like a Dragula running over a possum. I don't know if it'll happen. A skeleton is better than a possum to run over. Yeah, it is. It's we crunchier. Do, we do have a reference in the uh, in the American Little Town in the back glass. There's uh, in the trees you see like a Mothman and a Jersey Devil, which is a reference to a possible future game you might make based off urban urban legends. It would be of the follow of America's most weird, like Mothman, Jersey Devil, Skunk Ape, uh, Aliens, uh, Frey Road Beast, things like that. Uh, and, and also, you, you said that you've. Uh, what have you learned from other designers? Like you said, Steve Ritchie and uh, Python. You've taught, you've, you've met. You've Python, Python didn't really give me any pointers. Nothing. Well, he told me that holding onto pinball flippers is like grabbing a woman's hips, but nothing really gameplay-wise. Okay. <laughs> That's something he would say, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was an interesting character. I, I, I wish I could have met him. Uh, 
Um, but I, uh, he was a, never a dull moment. I only met him three times, but every time I met him, he said something I'll never forget. His his, uh, his game is being uh, pinball circus. Pinball circus is yeah. being is being made. It's flipping uh, at the show today. I, I actually made it to the top and knocked out the teeth. It's the third time I've done. I did it once here and twice at the Pinball Hall of Fame, and it's. It, is it's, the Pinball Hall of Fame worth going to? It's yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's. I've it's, heard mixed reports. Oh, the games don't work a hundred percent. I want my money back. That must be the mixed report I heard. Yeah. Yeah, delete that and then okay. I go by my own review, but I I volunteered there a few times and it's uh after you <laughs> after I volunteered and uh worked on game in an environment of two hundred games, I go to work on my route and I'm like, This is easy. <laughs> it's like really? I'm like that <laughs> Pinball isn't hard compared to that, you know. Two hundred games in a room. It's a good variety, uh, fifty sixties and uh modern stuff. They have a, a Woe Nelly uh, they're like one of the first people to get it. So they have the old one, the uh, prototype. I Swish. I think they did. I think uh, they, it came straight from a a show uh, that was in uh, in Vegas, and um, I look forward to seeing how it did. And um, lastly, I'd like to know, in a nutshell, um, uh, what the process and uh, your time with uh, with John Papaduke was like, and what you learned in a in a nutshell <laughs> oh gosh that thing so it was like um i i was um doing an episode of my show we were building pinball stuff and jerry ellsworth came over and we were working on some pinball stuff and uh then we got this random comment on on our website it was like i you know i could show you how, how to guy how you should guys really make pinball and it was from John Papaduke. And uh, looking back now, it was like his usual, I'm the teacher, everyone learns from me, kind of thing. But at the time, it was like, oh my God, it's John Papaduke. So uh, like, I emailed him or I, I contacted him back and then like, you know, we started talking and he's like, yeah, we should work on some stuff together. And I was like, oh, cool. And at that time, he had already started this Magic Girl thing. And then he's like, well, I should make a zombie game and you should be the bad guy in it then. I'm like, uh, okay. And then I think that was before Zombie Yeti was involved. Because I know Zombie Yeti right. actually was a fan of mine, and that's one of the reasons he wanted to do it with John, which I learned years later from Zombie Yeti after everyone, you know, started, you know, buying him drinks, so to speak. So of course, I contacted him. Who didn't? But <laughs> anyway, so the thing was, with that whole process, I was, wasn't really that involved at all. Like, um, every so often, I would go down and visit John's shop, or he would come to visit my shop, and we'd work on ideas. But we never even really got to a phone call. I wasn't, again, I mean, I wasn't really involved enough to be invested. You know, I had some ideas, like I wanted there to be a lower play field with, like, rotating disc. Right, I saw and, that, yeah, the video would, online of Yeah, like, and you, you on would it. complete one stage, and then it would rotate. Right, that was neat. Another stage, yeah, and I don't know if that was going to be in the game or not. I know. Um, yeah, but then, I didn't feel that he understood the zombie genre. All he understood was that people wanted zombies. He didn't understand the genre. He didn't watch the movies or keep up on the no where because it's been you know building for over ten years of you know sixty days later and Walking Dead yeah and everything's just really bubbling. I really hope that trend is coming. Years. And I'm so sick of zombies. What? Yeah, sorry. There, I, I watched The Walking Dead. You know, some, I expected to Atlanta zombie to samurais, be full of zombies. zombies in outer space. We're not done here. I mean, look, we're in the same boat, but it's not done. But we're. I really think 80s kitsch nostalgia would be the next thing, like Kung Fury and Danger Five. Well, anyway, back to the yeah. Zidware thing. So yeah, I mean, we, I know we, we had this idea for like a uh, ski ball skill shot, you know, some cool stuff. And the original concept was like I was, I was this mad scientist with a zombie lab, and it was the zombie lab was under an abandoned theme park. And this guy and this girl go to the abandoned theme park to make out one night, and then I capture her, and then you're the guy, you're the player, and you had to get it back, right? Simple, right? That's simple. No, I like that. And uh, I want, I was gonna turn into my zombie queen, like so we were gonna have her like dangling above a vat of zombie juice, and stuff, and then I guess John just changed everything. That's very horrible. That's that's a good, that would be a good movie. 
Yeah, well, I think what really boiled down to is he just wanted to make an amusement park game because he's obsessed with Python Angelo games, like Cyclone or whatever. He had a Cyclone in his shop. And uh, I think he just kind of lost track of what the theme was. I mean, if you look at, um, I think the thing where I really, really became worried about him, it wasn't just that empty cabinet thing yeah. at Expo. It was when I saw like the post where he's like, I'm going to put my game on a rug and have a La- Labowski effect. Like L.A. Bowski. And I'm like, oh, he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what the big Lebowski is. He doesn't understand what this movie's about. He just understands that people like it. And then he had a URL someone found. Because once everyone at, at Expo, everyone got pissed, you know. And someone was like, what the hell is this? And they found this URL for Pussycat Bowling or something. And it was like these cat women, and they were bowling, and this was a game concept, I guess, that he had. And so he just, he just saw, oh, people like bowling. And that's what he that's what he took away from it. He didn't understand I'm I'm not I'm not a fan of the movie, but I can see how it translated well. Big Lebowski. It, 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 to me, it translated very well, yeah. and it was, uh, it was it was shooting. The quality looked good. I, oh, I, I thought I, it was I just, thought it was awesome. Definitely. I mean, it's, if they can get it built, it'll be it'll be a slam dunk. And, and the term he came up with that the Lebowski Lola, Lola effect. Lebowski effect. Lebowski. Because he spelled it how people how it's pronounced. Right. Because you you say Big Lebowski, you don't say Big Lebowski. No, no. You say Big that. Lebowski. So he was typing it as he heard it, which means he had no idea what it was. Right. And uh, and you remember when the people found the fo- like people went to his shop and took photos of the windows, and he had the Magic Girl game sitting on a rug. He just thought for some people for some reason people wanted games on a rug. He just he just clearly didn't get it, and that's where I'm like, oh, this is not good. And because <laughs> and so you know this this whole you know when it started I. I, I, I see you on the back glass, and, you know, in yeah. the art, and I, and and they, you know, it's. Not, well, his idea was he wanted to get the younger video game people interested in it. That's right. why, like, with me. And that you would come out, and 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 to me, it's like when they said, "All right, we'll come out and help you build it," and this this kit. And I'm like, that oh, sounds that amazing. I, I never but I was just, that. I was, it sounded he amazing. He announced that at a like, show, wow. and I was like, what? Well, the thing is, you know. I don't know. I mean, I have I have a calculator. I can do math. It's like, it's like okay, so you're gonna not. So first of all, finish a game in someone's home. That's ridiculous. Second of all, like flying to someone's home or transporting a game, like that's a lot of money. Traveling is very expensive. It's like, how how, how does that work? Where do they live? Yeah, it's like, what if they're in England? Yeah. You're gonna look at like a thousand dollars to ship the game. Well, probably more than that. Ugh. I just the math just didn't work. I mean, even if the customer paid for, you know, your fish and chips and your, your yeah. lager, it's just... Well, his programmer was in England, remember? I, I didn't know that. Yeah, another one, one of the guys that I, surfaced out of the woodwork. And it's like, like, applesauce or whatever he was on Pinside. It's like, okay, so you spend probably two grand shipping a play field to this guy, because it's extraordinarily expensive to ship to England. Right. Then you have the worst exchange rate for U.S. dollars that you can possibly imagine. It just does not make sense. Of course, well, yeah, you can't deal with logic or expect to deal with logic in those situations. But it's still mind blowing. So anyway, the main thing that broke Camel's back with the zombie game is John did not did not like the fact I was helping Chuck, and Chuck had a competing zombies game, even though <laughs> neither game came out anywhere close to that. And yeah, he was like, "You got to make a choice, man. You can only work with me or work with Chuck." And I'm like, okay. But the thing is, I didn't feel like I had any input into the game anyway, the zombie game. It was like, you know, I didn't feel like I had any authorship, so why did I care? I didn't have any investment in it. You, you spent, you know, were you like brainstorming, hey, this is a good idea? And is we, it, we talked about stuff like that, but it, nothing ever got built, and it was, you know, again, I wasn't there nearly as much as anybody no, else. No. But, I mean, the narrative of just farting around arts and crafts, I can see how that could probably carry over to everything that happened there. It's just like just get it done, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not. I mean, I guess at this point, you know, it's fair game to throw people under the bus, but you also want to like try to put the pieces together. Like, what happened? Yeah, I wonder. I you know, I wonder. That's why. I mean, uh, I was there a week before Expo. I was there for work, and I last year. Yeah, and I I, I said, you know, can I do an interview? And I. I I just I sent him the, you know, the questions before and I never do that. I just I'm usually like, I just wing it and um, and I you know I saw the play fields in the in the games and things and um, 
when he said that it took eight months to do a play field because other you know people who produced I guess other play fields wouldn't do it or they they you know cost costed him out so to say but the, I get but if someone's doing hundreds of play fields as opposed to 14 or 13 or a hundred I just the things I didn't see the red flags when I interviewed him and then also I I don't know I just I didn't really see any red flags either back I didn't know day. I you know but they sure popped up and, and that's why I'm you know I'm wondering about you know petite pinball it's it's like if you can produce something you know and you can show that like along the way the trick is to develop the game on your own money right because when you're saying oh we want this much money because you know we think the game's going to cost let's just say it's ten thousand dollar game we think the bill of materials is six thousand dollars four thousand dollars profit per game so we sell 100 games means we have four hundred thousand dollars with which to develop the game or less but if it takes more than that to develop it then boom you're in the hole so what we've done is um yeah, um, I you know develop American Most Wanted on my nights and weekends. I don't get paid unless they ship. You know, I get a percentage of shipped games. And same thing with Chuck. Like he made very little money until the games actually started going out the door. And that's a great way to get your ass in gear and get stuff done. It's a lot easier. You you work a lot harder for money you don't have than money that's already in the bank. That that's, and when you said that yesterday in the presentation. I instantly felt that in my life because every dollar I make from my route, I put right back in. And that's I, what Chuck does every too. damn penny. Yeah. It's like I don't, <laughs> even if, even when I'm doing multiple times better, it's, it's I want to level up to supporting that instead of saying, all right, whatever, let me blow it. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a process. But thank you very much uh, for the interview, no and uh, I look forward to future games.